No matter how many games in the Wipeout series you've played, everybody has a memory of an absolute bastard of a track. This video is going to relive some of those nightmares and take a look back at some of the most difficult tracks in the entire series. So let's go all the way back to the start and take a look at the original Wipeout. The first three tracks in the original Wipeout may have had some nasty tricks up their sleeve, but they were fairly straightforward. However, that false sense of security was quickly broken when you reach Corradera. Most of the circuit is littered with quick corners, requiring you to be fairly good with the air brakes to maintain the craft's balance. Throw in a few sharp blind corners as well and you have a considerably tricky circuit. There's also one part in the track where you fly over a tall peak. If you're playing on Rapier class, you'll need to slow your craft down before you go over the top. If you don't, the craft will leave the track entirely. Arados 4 has a larger number of straight sections than Corradera, however it also has a larger number of tight corners, most of which are blind. Arados's track tends to be quite unstable and requires a lot of pitch control to manage the undulations. It's usually at this stage, especially on Rapier class, where you need to get the hang of opposite braking. No matter what Corradera or Arados 4 could throw at you, it's nothing compared to Silverstream. Multiple paths, undulating track sections, quick destabilizing corners, sharp blind corners, and unusually for the first wipeout game, a hairpin corner, this track is widely regarded to be the most difficult in the entire series. The track splits in half at two locations on Silverstream, once near the start and another around halfway round. On this run I've taken the left route both times. This branch contains some of the most difficult corner sequences in the entire game, however for those that can handle it, it's significantly quicker than the right branch. The right hand branches do tend to be easier than the left hand counterparts but they do add around 2-3 to three seconds to your lap time. When racing on Silverstream, you want to avoid this route at all costs, otherwise it's likely you could fall so far behind you don't see another craft for the remainder of the race. So not only is the track brutally unforgiving in general, it also forces you to take the more risky options just to keep up with the remainder of the pack. Put all of this together and Silverstream has rightly earned its place as number one bastard of the entire series. Gardaropa is a track that likes to punish the impatient. It presents you with a large number of straight sections tempting you to go flat out, before throwing you straight into a complex corner series. The interior sections are also very dark, making it difficult to judge corners, and outside you can be put off by lightning flashes. But what really adds to the difficulty is the fact that you can't race this track on anything other than Rapier class until you complete the Phantom Tournament. So it's not as though you can use the lower speed classes to get used to the layout, you need to throw yourself straight in at the deep end.
Odessa Keys is absolutely riddled with sharp blind corners, some of which are very difficult to tackle in a heavy craft. You need to have good thrust management to be able to tackle this circuit, and the final corner is next to impossible at full speed. Also, just like Garderopa, you can only race it at Rapier class until you complete the Phantom Tournament. Vostok Island is one of two tracks in the game that are unavailable at the start. You need to complete the Phantom Tournament to unlock them. And it's an absolute beast of a track as well. Lots of quick destabilising corners, a few sharp blind turns, and later on in the lap the track narrows out considerably. But the biggest problem is that this track goes one step further than Garderopa and Odessa Keys. You can only race it on Phantom Class until you complete the Piranha Tournament. I don't think I've ever managed to do that corner. And the final track from 2097 is Spilskin Anchor. This track is incredibly unpredictable, and when you first race it, it can seem like it will just disappear from in front of you. There's a number of sections of broken track as well which will need very good air brake management to navigate, otherwise you could find yourself flying off the track entirely. Couple this with very dark indoor sections, lightning strikes outside and the fact that you can only race this on Phantom Class until you complete the Piranha Tournament, this is by far the most difficult track in 2097. Stanza Inter is only the fourth track in Wipeout 3, but it is very tricky, especially in a heavy craft. Most of the track consists of consecutive sharp turns, some of them being blind. However, the branch you encounter a short way around the circuit can also be very difficult. If you go right as you see in this run, you encounter a series of very quick left-right bends, which can easily destabilise a heavy craft. Go left and you encounter a straight but very narrow track section. But while it may be easier to navigate, the exit into the next corner is incredibly difficult. Haifumi has a number of tricky corner series that can tighten on you without warning. You'll need to be very nimble on the air brakes on this one, as the entrances to a lot of the corners are not ideal. There's also a very tricky section near the end of the course. The track dramatically narrows and you're forced to take a left-hand turn. Under normal circumstances it would be fairly easy, but with the track that narrow you need to get it absolutely spot on. Pimar Project is one of those tracks that at first glance doesn't appear to be too bad, but the fact is, it's a subtle bastard. A lot of the long shallow corners on this track tend to be very narrow, and as a result it's very difficult to maintain the turn. You need to be very good with the opposite braking to avoid clattering into the wall at high speed. There's also a tight chicane series and a hairpin that's a nightmare in a heavy craft. Prototype tracks only become available when you gain a medal on every track using every craft in a particular speed class. Doing this on three different speed classes earns you the right to race on LS103, and my god it is a nightmare. Because of the simplified textures on the track, sometimes it's difficult to predict upcoming corners. And when you consider that a lot of them are quite sharp and on narrow track sections, that's a real problem. It's also worth noting that the prototypes are only available in single race. You can't practice them in time trial.
And now we come to Wipeout Fusion and we start off with Cubis Float Course 2. Before I talk about the track itself, I should mention the fact that I've had to change my criteria for choosing these circuits because of the differences in the physics system between Wipeout Fusion and the older games. If you look back at the videos from the original Wipeout, you'll notice that no matter how slight a wall collision is, it would immediately bring the craft to a complete halt. Fusion though is a totally different story. If you collide with the wall here, you'll simply scrape along it and only slowly lose speed. So how I've chosen difficult tracks for this section is how hard they are to navigate cleanly. The outdoor sections of this Cubis float track are actually not too bad, it's the indoor sections that can be the problem. Those sections twist and turn very quickly and it can be quite a task trying to keep a craft under control. The worst part though is the ice cave. It's incredibly difficult to control your craft and it's also very dark. On the forward circuit it can actually be trial and error as to whether you can make it through cleanly. The reverse variant of the circuit has three separate track splits. This run will show the left hand branches. The first and third branches actually don't have that much difference between them. It's worth just going down whichever one is more accessible. However, just like back in Silverstream, the second branch can make a massive difference to your race. Because that branch gives you such an advantage, you do need to be very quick on the left air brake to get your craft onto it. You'll notice at the second split on this run that the right branch is significantly easier to drift onto. And you'll also notice that it's more complex and much longer. Aside from the ice cave, this is one of the major difficulties in this circuit. Because it is so easy to drift onto the harder branch, it makes life much more difficult. The third course of Alka Vexus is a very long track and it loves throwing you into blind corner after blind corner. This is a circuit that really tests your use of the air brakes if you don't want to be wall grinding for most of the track. The open section at the end is also very tricky. One wrong move and you'll end up slamming into a pillar, grinding to a halt and severely damaging your craft. <laughs> The reverse variant is just as, if not more difficult than the forward circuit. While it's possible to get a better line into the open section, a lot more corners are now very difficult to see. And you need absolutely perfect timing to get the turn by the waterfall right.
Volsquare Course 3 is actually a bit of a mixed bag. While the indoor sections do tend to twist and turn quite a lot, it's the outdoor sections that can catch people out. Navigating the bridge struts on the open section can be quite tricky. You need to remember which paths are accessible and which ones are blocked. Near the end though, you'll come to another outdoor section and the quick corners are thrown at you thick and fast. It doesn't get any easier if you play the course backwards. You now have to deal with the complex outdoor section first, and the approaches are not necessarily as good as they were before. And if you get the approach into the open section wrong near the end, you could find yourself slamming into a bridge strut. Oh my god, this course is horrible! Temtesh Bay Course 2 is an absolute travesty of a circuit. It's difficult for all the wrong reasons. It's littered with sharp blind corners, you have two parallel track sections that you can easily jump between, you've got open sections that can send you ploughing into a random rock pillar, and those bulkheads. Those bloody bulkheads. They don't open until you are practically on top of them. Basically, you're completely blind to the track up ahead, and there are loads of them all through the circuit. It's not so bad once you get outside, but there is nothing more difficult than that first section in the entire game. And no, it isn't any easier the other way round. Shenkyu Project made its debut back in Wipeout Pure, and believe it or not, it was actually slightly easier than the version in HD Fury. The thing is though, that's mainly down to the handling of the craft. You have a very sharp hairpin near the start, further round you have an outward bank left hander, and near the end, a very quick chicane series. And of course, this was only the third circuit in Wipeout Pure. Sitten Wover has a few characteristic difficult sections, most notably a very sharp right hairpin halfway round the track. But that's not why this course is listed here. It's here because of an incredibly difficult undulating chicane series about three quarters of the way round. Navigating such a sharp chicane series is difficult enough, but the undulations are so great they can actually throw your craft off the track, or even worse, flip it upside down entirely. Sabenko Climb needs no introduction. It's by far the most difficult circuit in Wipeout Pure. Plenty of very sharp corners that require you to be very good with your air brakes and with your pitch management. But to be honest, it is still slightly easier than its incarnation in Wipeout HD. Sabenko Peak is one of the shortest circuits in the game, but it is still brutally difficult in places. Some of the corners are designed to throw your craft off balance before going into a tricky corner. 
There's a very tight chicane series halfway round, and at the end is a banked left-hander that is very difficult to judge correctly. We kick off the Wipeout Pulse section with Platinum Rush. This course is cut from the same mould as Pimar Project in Wipeout 3. It does have its fair share of sharp corners, but it's the quick shallow ones that can throw you off more than anything. The bank sections of the track also like to throw your craft up in the air, so you will need some good pitch management to keep it under control. The black run sends you through the more difficult sections right from the start, and it can be even more difficult to keep control of the craft as it's thrown up into the air. There are some sections where managing your thrust is crucial to navigating the track cleanly. Outpost 7 easily ranks up among the most difficult circuits in the entire series. The track has a nasty habit of darting about unpredictably, making your racing line absolutely crucial. But the most difficult feature of the circuit is the double hairpin very soon after the start of the track. The circuit can be even more unforgiving on the black run. The approaches to some of the corners are now nowhere near as favourable. And the hairpins have also lost most of their speed pads, so you'll need to be a lot more accurate with them than you were in the white run. Vostok Reef's white run is actually not that bad a track. It does have its fair share of sharp chicanes, but the majority of them are going downhill. This makes them much easier to see and it provides a better line through them. So you may be asking, what is this track doing in this video? The answer to that question is the black run. Having to tackle the same sharp corners going uphill is a completely different story. The corners themselves now have a habit of throwing your craft into the air, making them much more difficult to navigate. As a result of that, you need to turn very early into the corners and allow your momentum to swing the craft through them. It's a technique that requires a lot of practice, and you need to be very familiar with the layout of the circuit before you can handle it properly. Gemini Dam will test your ability to use the air brakes to its absolute limit. The track is absolutely littered with consecutive sharp corners, some of which are right angled. You need to have a very good racing line through this circuit. If you don't, it can punish you badly. The black run is absolutely relentless. There are now far more right angled corners than there were in the white run and the two mag strips now completely blind you to the entrances to some of these corner series. You need to have absolute pinpoint control over your craft because the track will not do you any favours. Shengyu Project is back in Wipeout HD and it has a few new tricks up its sleeve. The layout of the course is identical to how it was in Wipeout Pure. However, the track is a lot narrower through the hairpin and the outward banked corner is now steeper. This makes it much more difficult to keep your craft in contact with the track and as a result you'll need good pitch management to do it. The reverse variant is easier in some places but more difficult in others. The quick chicane at the start of the track has a less favourable line, as does the hairpin, which now appears near the end. However, the banked corner has now been flattened out, making it much easier to navigate. Sabenko so Climb also makes a return from Wipeout Pure, and like Shengyu Project, it is more difficult this time round. 
The sharp corner series going up the mountain require you to be very hard and very fast on your air brakes. Timing is everything. And then near the end of the track, coming out of that highly banked corner and landing in that chicane series is not easy. The hardest part of the reverse circuit is trying to land in that chicane series coming at it from the other side. As you can see, the line going into it is very fine. Another thing you have to tackle are the sharp corner series, only this time going downhill. This requires you to have even better timing on your air brakes due to the speed that you gain from going downhill. The opening part of the Ubermall circuit is actually not that difficult. Where it starts to get hard is the track split. Coming out of the split, the track goes uphill and narrows dramatically. It then throws you into a chicane series. And if you can handle the craft well enough to manage that one, there's another even trickier chicane series waiting for you at the top of the incline. The reverse circuit is just as tricky. The entrance to the first chicane series is still not ideal, so you'll need to have good air brake and side shift use to get through it. And if you approach the second chicane at any reasonable speed, you may have to tackle it while in mid-air. Modesto Heights is a very tricky circuit indeed. Aside from the large number of right angle corners, there's also a number of banked corners that can cause you to lose control without quick reactions. Plus the interior section can be quite dark, making it difficult to see where you're going if you're unfamiliar with the track. And doing the course backwards makes life even more tricky. It's very difficult to get a good line through the shallow chicane series when you're coming at it through a banked corner. And the double right hander near the end of the indoor section has an incredibly difficult approach. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it, subscribe to the channel. It's feedback from you guys that makes me keep wanting to do this. Thanks very much for watching. Oh, oh, oh.